So today I've got a pretty cool video with all this equipment from a company that you may have heard of. So I'd like to give a massive shout out to Ubiquity Networks for sending me this stuff to review. And just so I'm completely clear up front, Ubiquity did send me all this stuff free of charge, however they've not told me anything to say or you know, giving me scripts or making me do specific things or anything like that. So I've got full creative control over these videos. So I'm really excited to take a look at all this stuff and get it all set up in my flat. So you've probably seen my current network. If you haven't seen it, there's a video in sort of popping up in the corner you can click to view all my setup of my network. But I've currently got a mix set up between Unify and Vios. So I use a Unify access point and Unify switches, but then I use a Vios router and then host the controller on my server. And having used Unify for quite a while using the switches and access point, I'm really starting to like it. And I've wanted to go full Unify for quite a while because I feel that having the whole system with my router and everything in one environment would make it so much quicker to work with. Because at this point in time, I don't really have the time to muck about with different setups. I just want one setup that works really well and is quick to manage, yet still being really powerful. So for that, Unify is brilliant. So we've got these two boxes that they sent me. So let's go in and take a look at what I've got. So first of all, we'll take a look at the top box here, which is the smaller one. Might be less exciting, we'll see. Cool, uh, packing slip, try and get it out of the way so I don't have to blur that. There we go. Lots of packing material. And there we go, there's the first, pr first product. We have the new Cloud Key Gen 2 Plus. So this is a Cloud Key Gen 2 Plus, which is a new management controller. So while you can run the Unify controller on any sort of server or Raspberry Pi or anything like that, and that's what I do currently, Ubiquiti also sell the Cloud Key products, which are all-in-one controller, so you plug it into your network and it hosts the software and everything itself. And to be honest, after running it on my server, the idea of this really starts appealing to me, because there's times I'd muck up the config on my server or you know, knock the network settings out or the VM would go down or something like that, and it made it a real pain to get back into the controller to fix the settings, so having a dedicated piece of hardware plugged into the network does appeal. I looked at the original cloud key and it looked kind of cool, but didn't look particularly fancy, and it, I thought oh, I'll just use a Raspberry Pi or something instead. But when they launched the Gen, 2, the Gen 2 series, I had to get one because they look really cool. They've got this lovely little screen on them that shows stats, which is pretty much just a bit of eye candy, but it just looks great. This is the Gen 2 Plus instead of the normal Gen 2. The Gen 2 Plus contains a hard drive and can run the Unify video software for their cameras. So you can also record video onto the hard drive built into this particular model. And while it's not available yet, they're also saying they're going to release a rack mount kit for this, so you can really neatly rack mount it, which looks brilliant, so I'm really looking forward to that coming out. Now what we'll do here is we'll take all the products out, then go through them one by one, and then we'll look at them all individually. I'll probably break the series into a few different parts, because it'll take ages if I try and do it all in one. So what we'll do in this video is we'll take a look at all the hardware I've got and do unboxings and look around each product. Then in the next video I'll go and set it all up from scratch, and we can look at the setup and performance of everything. So that was the cloud key. Now let's see what's in this big box. Because while it says USG Pro on the front, that's not all that's in here. So a bit of foam that can go over there. Now, the first thing we have is an access point. And this is their new Nano HD. So this is their new access point, and it's a sort of cut-down version of the UAP HD. So it's one of their top-end access points for performance. So this should be really powerful. And it's, yeah, it's pretty low priced. It's not that badly priced for the power it has. I think it's 717.33 megabits a second or something theoretical. Of course you don't get that in practice, but that's the highest theoretical throughput of any of the Unify access points. It's right up there the same as the, the full-on HD access point, but the Nano HD is a bit smaller and a lot cheaper. So I'm really interested to try this out and see what performance I get. Because while I currently do have a Unify access point, it's an original generation AP Pro. So it's not even wireless AC, it's dual band wireless N. So it is starting to lack in the performance department a bit. So this thing's gonna be a massive upgrade. Next up in the box, we have some other bits. So here we have the UVC G3 micro camera. So this is one of their cameras. This one in particular is a wireless model. So this, they have wired ones or this single wireless model. So this is really cool. So we'll take a look at that later. What I think I'll do is I'll do a separate video for the camera stuff because that's going to be quite a separate project. So we'll look at all the networking stuff in this video and the next video and then I'll do a third video of all the cameras. Because they're going to be really cool to try out. And they'll all record to that cloud key which will be brilliant. The next camera we have is a UVC G3 AF. This is their indoor outdoor camera so while that's an indoor model only, this one can also be used outdoors. It has an IR illuminator 
and it just looks like a really good camera. They're full 1080p video out of these, so that'll be really good quality. So I'm really excited to try this out. Because I don't currently have any home cameras, and I've not really thought about them before. But to be honest, having a couple would be quite nice, just so if I'm away, I can just check on things. If I got a message saying my alarm's gone off, I can at least check and see if anyone's in the property, because if you phone the police and say, oh, my alarm's gone off, but I can't confirm anyone's in the property, they're not going to come out. So having these will be really useful. It just gives me peace of mind, really. Next one I've sent is the UVC G3 Flex. So this is one of the new cameras they've launched. It's a really small one, and it's designed to be really flexible for mounting. So you can stand it on a table, you can mount it on a wall, you can mount it in ceilings, you can mount it on poles. It's not fully outdoor use, but you can use it outdoors under an overhang, I think. And it's yeah, it, and like the G3, it's wired in and it's PoE powered. So this will be really cool to play with as well. And now for the final product, the biggest one, which the box sort of gave away, I think. Oh, it's that heavy. They've sent me the Security Gateway Pro. And that is going to completely fall off there, but we'll try and see if that stays up. So yep, this is the, UVC, the Unified Security Gateway Pro, or the USG Pro. And this is their, not top of the range, but their middle of the road professional security gateway. So they do the small Unified Security Gateway, the little desktop one, which is pretty cool, but its performance isn't insane. It's fine for most tasks, but when you start switching on the intrusion detection, intrusion prevention, and deep packet inspection features, it can limit the throughput a bit. So going for the Pro model means it'll get a bit better performance for that, so hopefully that won't limit my performance too much. The Pro is also rack mount, which is also brilliant, so it'll look really neat in a rack. So I'm really excited to try this out. Because while I do love having setups with things like Vios or PFSense, I find that I just don't have the time to keep managing it. For example, I've, been, I've had this network over a year now, and my router there still doesn't have the firewall rules set up to, to isolate the guest network from my main network, because I've not got round to it. So hopefully just having the Unify environment will make it so much quicker to set up, and if I need to make changes to it, it should be so quick, so I'm really excited to try this bit of kit out. So there we go, that's the massive amount of kit they've sent me to take a look at. So what we'll do now for the remainder of this video is we'll take a look at the networking hardware, we'll unbox everything, take a look at each piece of kit individually, and then in the next video we'll set it all up, and do a full setup demonstration, and then do all the performance tests, and then in a third video after that, we'll take a look at all the cameras. So we'll leave the cameras for now, and take a look at the security gateway, the cloud key, and the Nano HD access point. So the first item we'll take a look at is the Nano HD access point. This is a brand new AP launched very recently by Ubiquiti, and it's a baby brother of the full-on UAP HD, while being a lot cheaper. It supports up to 200 concurrent users, which is lower than the AP HD, and is the same as the AC Pro. However, unlike the AC Pro, the Nano HD supports up to 1733 megabits a second on the 5 gigahertz band, as opposed to the lower 1300 megabits a second on the AC Pro. Now, of course, those are theoretical speeds, you're not going to get those in practice, especially since the devices only have gigabit ports, so you're not going to get higher than that. But the higher theoretical speed should hopefully translate into higher actual speed. So that'll be really nice to try out. It also has full 4x4 multi-user MIMO, which will be good for lots of concurrent users. And it currently retails for $179, or about £153 in the UK. So it's a really affordable access point, yet it has really good performance. So let's take a look at what we get. So, it's basically the same box as all Ubiquiti access points. We'll see what we get in here. Cool, so there we have the access point. It's actually really small, it's a lot smaller than my current access point, the older original um, AC, um, AP Pro, non-AC. So that's the Nano HD there, it's got a little plastic cover on the bottom. So that's really small, it's actually probably about the same as like the AC Lite which I've used before, and like thinner than the AC LR, so yeah it's actually quite thin and small. It's got a really nice rubber, fi rubber sort of finish on it, which almost reminds me of like older ThinkPads, that's sort of rubbery finish. And it's got a metal back, so that feels a lot sturdier than like the AC Lite. It's got a full-on metal back, so that's really cool. So on the bottom you've got this bracket which you can take off. You can mount that to a surface, either a ceiling or a wall or something like that. Then you can even mount these on like conduit and stuff. And then you screw that on, and then click the access point in place. On the bottom of the access point we've then got a reset hole there, and the gigabit ethernet port, which is also the PoE power input. And unlike some of the older access points, 
This supports proper 802.3 AF PoE, so you can use a PoE switch or a generic PoE injector. You don't need to worry about proprietary PoE, so that's really good. It's also got this little rubber plug on the bottom you can pull out, or plastic plug. Pull that out somehow. Well, it's stiff. There we go. So that comes out and you can use that to feed a cable out. So if you've got it mounted, fl mounted flush to a wall and you've surface mounted the cable, you can still install it into there. And actually, struggling to get it out was actually a good thing because my current access point is a little bit loose and it falls out sometimes. So it's quite good at being very strongly attached in there. Next up we've got a sort of quick start guide. A different type of brackets. This is a more... Actually, also this, this is a, a back plate. So what this will be is if you're mounting it on a ceiling tile, you put this on the other side of the ceiling tile and I think they screw through into that. I think that's how it works because they line up. So that's a sort of back plate for it. I won't be using this, but I will be mounting it on the ceiling, so I will be using this bracket. Finally, we get a PoE injector, if you're not using a PoE switch. So that's it there. And it's got a pair of ports there, LAN in, PoE out, and it's got a little bracket on the back so you can mount it somewhere, and a cloverleaf power input. It also comes with a cloverleaf cable. Unfortunately, this is a US plug, so it won't actually fit my country. That's just because I, this was shipped from the US because I got it from Ubiquity. If you're buying this from a local distributor, you should get the correct plug for your country sent in the box. Now finally we just get some raw plugs and screws to fix it onto things, so that's pretty nice. Yep, you get full long screws and, bolt and little nuts, so you can use that with this back plate on ceiling tiles. So it comes with all the hard mounting hardware you'd need, which is really cool. So next we'll take a look at the Cloud Key Gen 2 Plus. So I'm really interested to see this because I've never seen one before. I've seen loads of access points, but I've never seen a Cloud Key before, or at least this generation and it looks really nice in the pictures. So I'm hoping it's as nice as in real life. There it is, let's see what we get. Oh, don't get to see it yet. Let's see what's here. Oh, that's it there, so we get a little thing of paper. Oops, we get a a basic manual for setting it up there and then you get it's like a, yeah, like a vinyl sticker so I suppose that's for the camera so like I don't know if you stick it on like a window or something to show you've got security cameras but yeah that's you get a sticker with it there oh actually you get, you get a couple actually yeah they're not yeah they're not like peel type stickers they are literally vinyl stickers you stick on a window that's quite cool and now we have the cloud key itself so it's got a little Apple style tab to lift it up. There we go. And that's it, and that feels really nice. It feels quite heavy, so it's got a lot of weight to it, which is good. Um, so we can peel this all back, see what it's like. They've definitely taken a leaf out of Apple's book with the packaging on this. This is really nice. Especially compared to most other sort of enterprise networking stuff that comes in a brown box with some foam. This is pretty nice. The only other thing to bear in mind with this is that it doesn't include a power adapter in the box. It's very much designed expecting you to power it over PoE. So if you don't have a PoE switch, you'll either need to get a PoE injector or a Qualcomm Quick Charge 2 compatible power brick to power it. So it's not the end of the world, it's just worth bearing in mind so you don't buy one of these, urgently need to set it up and not have a way to power it. So now here we have the Cloud Key Gen 2 Plus and it feels absolutely lovely. It's got a huge amount of weight to it, it just is a really nice finished product. It almost feels a shame to like hide this away in a cupboard because it's actually quite nice. So in the front you've got a little screen here which I think is probably OLED. It's a fairly small little screen there that shows some sort of status information. A little LED there. Then around the back you see we've got some ports so we've got a power switch there to turn it on and off. You've got a USB-C connector here which can be used for power so you can power it with a quick charge compatible power supply. Then you've got the gigabit ethernet port here which also supports PoE so you can power this over PoE which is what most people will do with this. Then a little SD card slot that looks like up there. Yes, yeah, it's probably a yeah, micro SD card slot above that. And then finally along here there's another little USB-C port, which is like labelled hard drive. So I think it's for, it's for connecting external storage to it. You connect that into the USB-C port here. So that's quite nice. And it's kind of nice seeing USB-C on something like this. They are actually moving to the future, which is good. So now on the bottom of the device, you can see we've got some text on here. We've then got this little sticker here covering some contacts. Some pic the other pictures show little gold contacts here. They're just covered by a sticker on mine. And this is labelled Cloud Key Rack Link. 
This is for the rack mount kit when it's launched. And I imagine what will happen is you'll slot this into the rack mount kit and this will carry Ethernet to a port on the front of the rack mount so you won't have to use the rear port, you'll connect it straight into the front of the rack mount kit and that'll be connected up through this connector here. I'm not 100% sure that's what it's for but it definitely looks like it is. So hopefully they'll launch that kit soon and I'll be able to get that. And finally over here you've got a little thing labelled HDD release because this thing has a built-in hard drive for recording video. So hopefully we can do that, so I think you press that in there, facing. Yep, there we go. And that's released the hard drive so we can see what we get. Yep, that pulls right out there. And in this little caddy we've got a 1TB Toshiba hard drive. Cool, so I've just been away and looked this up, and this is a 1TB 5400rpm hard drive. The model number is the Toshiba MQ01 ABD 100V and the V model seems to be optimised for video use so it's actually a hard drive designed for DVRs and set top boxes and things like that. So it's good to see they've actually used a proper optimised hard drive in this. It just has different firmware designed more for sequential use rather than random use for a drive that would be used in a, in a regular computer. So that's the hard drive there. However you'll notice it's quite a large caddy and even though this is a really slim drive you could fit a thicker drive in here. That's because this thing can take full height drives up to 5 terabytes in size. So even though it comes with a terabyte out of the box, which should be loads, you can actually upgrade this to a bigger hard drive if you wanted to, which is why it's so easy to remove. So that's really nice to see. So this will be what I'll be using to record all the video from those cameras. I can record them from the cameras straight onto this hard drive without having to worry about setting up a server or anything like that. So this is really neat. And in theory that should just slot right back into the front of the cloud key. Yep, that's it in there. The other really nice feature of these new generation cloud keys is that they have a built-in battery to act as a sort of UPS to allow the unit to safely shut down in the event of power loss. So you can see here it's currently powered up. It's saying Ethernet disconnected because it's not actually on the network at the moment. But if I unplug it from the network, which will disconnect the PoE, it'll stay powered on. And then say power disconnected and do a, cut down, a countdown until it shuts down. So now it's actually going to cleanly shut down. So this is really useful. It means that you don't need to worry about powering this from some sort of UPS and it means in the event of a power loss it'll cleanly shut down so you don't have risk of things like the file system becoming corrupted, the databases on it becoming corrupted or more so for the CloudKey Gen 2 Plus which does the video recording it'll allow the NVR software to safely finish off all the video files so it doesn't suddenly lose power and you end up with a bunch of half written video files that you can't play back. So that's really nice to see. So now finally let's take a look at the biggest product of them all the USG Pro. And I'm really excited to see this because I've never seen one in person. Let's try and get this out. Let's see what we get. start guide. That's what cool of almost like embossed the Paul Siren there for it. And then we get uh, some little adverts for other products they do. Then other boring ones you get a power cable. Again it's not the right one for my country it's a US one but that's fine it's just because it, it's come from their central distribution it's not come from a local distributor. And then finally they've actually included some cage nuts that's quite nice to see. It's quite rare to get a kit that actually includes cage nuts, you're usually expected to supply them yourself. I mean, I've obviously got hundreds of them so I don't really need them, but it's nice to get them. That's quite nice. The sort of thing you'd buy the equipment and forget to order cage nuts. It's nice to get them in the box. And then finally we've got the USG Pro itself. So that looks really nice, so let's take a look at this. So now here we have the USG Pro 4 in all its glory. So it's a really nice device, it matches all the other Unify kit which will look really cool in a rack. So let's we'll take a look at the outside of it. So over here you've got the Unify logo with a light, a light up ring around it. So that'll be like all the other Unify devices that that'll show the status, so it'll show if it's actually connected and operating or if it's starting up or if it can't find a controller. You've got that LED there. You've then got an RG45 console port here. So that's not Ethernet, that's serial. And you can connect that into a computer probably to do like emergency configuration or to point it to a controller. So sometimes with kit you might not have a DHCP server or it might not work, especially given this is the router, so this is like the central part of the network. You might have an environment where it won't auto-configure and you'll need to manually set it up using the console port. So you can plug it into a laptop and probably get some sort of basic CLI on this to set it up. So that's what that is. That is that's for there. You then got a USB port there. 
Not sure what that's for. Then you've got some ports. So you've got four Ethernet ports and two SFP ports here. So you could use this with fibre if you wanted. You can see the first two ports are labelled LAN, LAN 1 and LAN 2, and the second two ports are WAN 1 and WAN 2. Now this is a 4 port device, not a 6 port device, and that's because the SFP ports are shared with the two WAN ports. So they're dual personality ports, so either you use the RJ45 copper port, or you use the SFP port. You can't use both at the same time for extra ports. But that's fine, so it's a 4 port device, and you've got the option of SFP or copper. The only minor niggle I have here is that the SFP ports are both shared with both the WAN ports, not the LAN ports. Now I have looked about online and apparently now with the new software version you can actually just reassign these ports. So if you've got an SFP connection on your LAN side, you can just reassign one of the WAN ports to operate as a LAN port and then use the SFP. So it's not a huge deal. It also means you can have a single WAN and then three LAN and things like that. It would just be quite nice if it was, if you had maybe one of them on the LAN side so you don't have to have to configure it with different labels and your labels become incorrect. Because from what I've found in practice, it's quite rare for a fibre internet connection to come in on the fibre that goes straight into the customer's router. Usually there's some sort of demarcation equipment from the ISP and then it goes over copper to the router. And I can definitely see scenarios where you'd actually want fibre from the USG to a switch, for, for example. So it would have been nice to see one of these on the LAN side, but it's not a huge deal. You can reconfigure that in software. It's also a really short depth device, which is cool, so that'll be good for some like quite short depth racks. It's always a pain when you get really deep network equipment and you've got a small patching cabinet that you can't fit it in. So this will be really good because it's actually really short depth. And around the back, you can see we've got a pair of 40mm fans they look like. We'll power it up quickly and see what they sound like. And then a power input, so not much on the back. The only unusual thing here is the power input is a cloverleaf, not an IEC connector. This is a bit unusual because everything I've normally, all the other normal networking equipment I use is a full on IEC connector, not cloverleaf. It's not a huge deal, you can just connect it up and it does come with a power cable. I could just see it, see it being a bit annoying, for example in some data centre environments, especially in the UK, you'll have power distribution units that don't take normal plugs, instead they take IEC connectors on the PDU, and it's very common to have piles of IEC to IEC leads lying around to connect devices up to it. So I could definitely see myself buying one of these, taking it to a data centre, and then realising that I don't actually have the cable to plug it in because I'd have an IEC to IEC that wouldn't fit this, and have a regular mains lead that came with the USG that wouldn't fit the PDU. It's not a huge deal of course, you can't actually just buy IEC to Cloverleaf cables. It's just worth bearing in mind that it's got it. So if you're deploying this in an environment that requires IEC connectors or expects an IEC connector on the device, you can get the appropriate cable in advance. So now let's quickly fire this up and see what it sounds like. We won't have to see it working because I'm going to have to configure it later in the next video, but I just want to see what the fan noise is like. So now let's fire this up and see what it sounds like. So it'll be quite hard to hear the actual sound level on camera, but I'll try and express it. So let's switch it on. So it's definitely quite loud now. We'll see if it quietens out once it's booted. Okay, so it's been running for quite a while and it still does seem to make quite a loud noise. So unfortunately it doesn't seem to be that quiet. It's the sort of thing that's fine in a data room or even a comms cabinet, but you definitely wouldn't want it sitting next to you in a room you're trying to relax in. So that's a bit of a shame. We'll, take, we'll pop it open and see how the fan, what the fans are like. You might be able to replace them. But yeah, you definitely wouldn't want this in its stock configuration sitting right next to you. But for any sort of data center configuration or server room configuration, which let, let's face it, is where these things are designed to be deployed, it'll be absolutely fine. So of course I had to pop it open. So it actually looks like a very simple but nice design. So over here you've got the main board, you've got a pair of chips here. I'd love to see what's under them, but I don't want to take the heat sinks off because I don't want to break it. You know, I kind of want to use this thing rather than break it. But you've got two chips there. You've then got a single 2GB stick of DDR3 RAM. So the RAM's technically replaceable or upgradable. Not sure why you ever would, you probably wouldn't want to. Bear in mind if you are taking this thing apart and you're changing parts that you're probably going to end up voiding your warranty, so you don't really want to take it apart. But it's nice to see that RAM is replaceable Especially if it failed, like if you had a memory problem down the line, you could replace it, it's not soldered on, which is nice. You've then got a pair of fans at the back. These are fairly thick, sort of server-style fans, but they are very much replaceable. They're 40mm fans, screwed into the case there, and they connect with a standard-looking 3-pin three, three PC fan cable. So you could actually replace these with quieter fans if you wanted to. You just need to make sure that the fans you replaced them with were decent enough airflow, because quite a lot of the 40mm fans are really thin and don't really move much air. 
However, not sure do do fans in this sort of form factor that might be a bit quieter. Just bear in mind that if you are replacing the fans, you probably will avoid your warranty, of course. Over here, we've got the power supply, which now, which now seeing this explains why it's got the cloverleaf connector on the back. And that's because rather than being some sort of open frame power supply or a PCB screwed into the case, it's actually like an external power brick fastened into this metal bracket. This is a pretty interesting design, but in some ways it makes sense. I imagine it has a lot to do with compliance. If you're fitting some sort of open frame board power supply into this, like a custom designed power supply for the USG, and you're mounting it into the case, you probably have to go through a lot of certification about getting it tested because it's a mains powered appliance, there's a lot of safety stuff to do. However, if they do it this way, they can likely use an off the shelf power supply that's already been tested and certified and just fasten it into the case. So that actually makes quite a lot of sense. And to be honest, I'd much rather see this sort of design instead of them giving me an external power brick that I have to plug in and put somewhere. At least having this built into the box is a lot better for having this thing in a rack. Next up you've got this little sort of dotter board here, which just has a pair of LEDs on it. So I imagine that's for that logo on the front, there's this like plastic cowling that'll take the light through, and that mounts over there, so that'll be the status LEDs. And then of course you can see you've got the four ports there, and then the two SFP ports. And interestingly there is actually space for more ports there. So they're probably using the same sort of PCB design as one of their other routers that has more ports on the front. So that's quite cool. So there you go, that was the final product in this video, the USG Pro 4. So now we'll quickly go over the pricing of all this stuff. While this kit's not particularly cheap by consumer standards, it's actually very competitive in the enterprise space against other competitors. So for this pricing, I'll give both USA and UK pricing. The USA prices are the ubiquity recommended retail price, which is why I'm giving that. And since in the US tax varies between states, those prices are excluding any tax. In the UK we don't have an actual Ubiquiti store, so instead I've got the prices from NetXL, which is an authorised Ubiquiti reseller, and it's where I've bought most of my Ubiquiti kit from in the past. And I'll give those prices including VAT and excluding it. And of course these prices are very much subject to change, due to either Ubiquiti changing pricing, or exchange rate fluctuations. So the first device we have is the CloudKey Gen 2 Plus. This retails for $199 in the US, or £210 in the UK including VAT, and £176 excluding VAT. Next we have the Nano HD access point here. This is $179 in the US, or £143 in the UK including VAT, or £120 in the UK excluding VAT. Which is really surprisingly cheap when you compare it to the other access points. To get this one with the HD performance, that's a pretty good price. Finally we have the security gateway, which I'm not going to attempt to hold up to the camera because it's quite heavy. And this retails for £344 in the US, or £249 in the UK, including VAT, or £208 excluding VAT. So while this stuff definitely isn't cheap, it's also not too bad when you compare it to other competitors. The other good thing with Ubiquiti Kit is the running costs. Once you've bought the kit, you can pretty much just use it forever and you don't need to keep paying for licensing fees. With other vendors, you either have to pay licensing fees for software, or maintain warranty service on the hardware if you want to get software updates, which is quite important for security. When I first got into Ubiquiti Kit, I was a bit concerned as to how long I'd get software updates for, because I was buying quite a proprietary device, and I was, I was a bit concerned that I'd buy it and then, you know, they'd drop support for the hardware I've bought in a couple of years' time, and then I'd be stuck with it. Now this was back when I got my first Unify Access Point in 2015, which is my current UAP Pro, and that thing still gets software updates. It was launched around 2012, and even in 2019 now, it's still getting updates released. In fact, I've just checked Ubiquiti's website, and even the first generation Unify Access Point, the standard UAP, that still gets software updates, despite being launched about 2011. So given that information, I'm now not too concerned about them dropping support for this hardware anytime soon. So there we go, that was the networking hardware we've taken a look at, and in the next video we're going to go away and set it all up. Now because this is such a fundamental change to my network, I'm not going to try and just migrate stuff over, I'm going to completely reset all my equipment and set this all up from scratch. So I'll try and show that on video and show the full setup process for a Unify environment, so that'll be really fun. I also can't wait to see the performance results for this. Then after that video, we'll then do a separate one and we'll look at all the cameras, and that'll be quite cool as well. So yeah, thank you very much for watching, and don't forget to stand by for future videos on all this Unify kit. And if you're interested in buying any of the products featured in this video, there's links down in the description. Thanks for watching.